welcome to Evil Done Badly. I am your host, Dick, and we are proudly the most terrible true crime podcast in the history of the world. Now that popcorn murder stories has been deleted from the internet, we are solidly in worse place by ourselves. I mean, they were giving us a run for our money there for a minute. I was a bit worried, I'm not going to lie. And, uh, well, I think we're firing away the, the worst by now. And you can always help us get to the bottom of the charts by giving us a pitiful rating wherever you are listening to us. It would be greatly appreciated. Now, thanks in advance. And what about today's case? Well, we've got a case from Atlanta, Canada today, and it'll be nice to be covering a local story. Even if the participants are from Pennsylvania. It's a state where every city starts with P. Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Phoenix, just to name a few. And I hear it's quite lovely this time of year. But before we get into that, grab yourself and a beverage, hold on to your arse, and let's hear the theme song. <laughs> This episode of Evil Done Badly is brought to you by... Fuck. Ah, shit. I was afraid this was going to happen someday. Uh, today's sponsor is uh, my mom. I really don't want to read this. Okay. I'm too poor to argue. I'll read her spot. All right. Here goes. Are you looking for a good time? Have you got 50 cents? Then come on down to Agnes Corner Old Pleasure and help yourself to Aggie's 50 cents of fun, super value menu of geriatric love maneuvers. She's hot, she's spry, and she's 95. And she's waiting to show you the time of your life. And for a dollar, she'll bring along her mom too for double the depravity and she's on the corner of skeet street and is available whenever you are check out her website at get laid right here.com and book yourself an experience you'll never forget and when you're done getting it on with agnes or as she likes to be called the best piece of ass in town. Sign up to the wide world of paranormal investigations and ridiculous thrifter groups over on Facebook. They each have over 14,000 followers and are blowing up more every day. Get in there now. Now back to the show. Mary Beth Hershberger was born in 1965 in Pennsylvania. Okay. Technically, that's not true. Well, the Pennsylvania part is true, but she was not always Mary Beth Harshberger. She was once known as Eddie Kinter. She's got a little extra testosterone bouncing around in there. So here you have a woman who really likes hunting and would grow up to be a little unstable. She also has two children, and I'm not sure how that worked. I think there might have been a male person involved there somewhere. Anyways, she marries Mark Hershberger in 2001, and they have a family. Mary and Mark are both seasoned hunters, and are totally capable of shooting the arse off a gay frog at a hundred yards out. So, they had exceptional marksmanship and are perfectly comfortable outdoors in the wilderness. They are so comfortable outdoors that they've killed every living thing in Pennsylvania and there's nothing left to shoot. So, they have to leave the state to track down some furry creatures. So, naturally... It occurs to them, hey, see this place? Let's go to this frigid rock in the Atlantic Ocean called Newfoundland. 
It's got very few people and a whole shitload of trees, snow, and wind. There's bound to be something furry there to shoot. Now, how they get turned on to the idea of going to Newfoundland is totally beyond me. It's a little out of left field. It's more or less the equivalent of me randomly saying, Hey, you know what sounds great? Let's go to Guam! I'm sure Guam is a nice place and all, but I can't see any conceivable reason why it would ever occur to me to go there. Well, I mean, that is unless Liberace was playing there. I mean, hell, then I'd paddle myself across the ocean in a $20 dinghy from Canadian Tire if I had to. I mean, that that's, uh... Liberace's unlikely to pay there anytime soon because he died almost 40 years ago. Yeah, God rest his silly, flamboyant soul. So, these two, they blindfold each other, throw a dart at a map, and decide that they're going deep into the Newfoundland forest to bag them a bear or two. I, uh, what? Can you just take a dead bear on a plane with you? How often does that come up? That seems uh, kind of hard to pull off. Anyways, these people pack up the mailman's children and head off to the frozen tundra of the Newfoundland wilderness in the fall of 2006. Also along for the festivities was Mark's brother, Barry Harshberger. On September 14th, the whole group of hunters and children were out on a backwoods logging road near something called Bakken's Junction in Newfoundland, Canada. See? How the fuck did these people find this place? I've lived here my whole life, and I had no idea where this place was. It's somewhere near a place called Grand Falls, though, which is a place I've been to once in my life to see a concert. It was good times. Bon Jovi killed it that day. Yeah, I'd do it again. Anyways, so they are out, prowling around with guns and a truck, and a fully capable hunting guide was showing them around the woods out there. I imagine the tour went something like this. Uh, over here, we got some trees. Uh, over here, there's some more trees. Uh, over here, there's an abandoned chevette. And, uh, over here is where my Uncle Bob took a shit in his hat. Etc, etc. Now, let's see if we can find something to shoot. So they spend all day poking around in the woods looking for bears. And the bears spend all day hiding from these people. So it's getting late. And there's no sign of any bears. Mary gets annoyed. And she decides she's going to camp out in the back of the truck with her rifle. And wait for something to happen. The whole time, her two kids are up in the cab. And they're very young. And they're probably asleep. Dusk is fast approaching. And the sun is quietly setting on the vast Newfoundland wilderness. Apparently, here in Newfoundland... There's a rule that says that hunting is allowed up until a half hour after sunset. So you're allowed to run around with a gun in the dark. And they still had a little time to try and snag themselves something to eat. The dark, the dark creeps in like it does. And the males in the group are still lingering around in the woods in a last ditch effort to flush out Winnie the Pooh. Mark and the guide are just fucking around in the woods and making their way back towards the road. Barry, the brother, meanwhile, he's still out hanging around in a blind they had set up farther back in the woods. I'm not exactly sure what a hunting blind is, but according to Google, it looks like a small, square, camouflage tent with holes in it for peeking out so the animals can't find you. Uh, I imagine Barry was just sitting in the blind and lighting up and getting stoned. I mean, what else are you going to sit in a box in the middle of the woods at night for? Barry seems quite happy that he hasn't found any bears. And Mary is still sitting in the back of the truck, peering in through the trees, through the dark, trying to find something to kill. She's got a fancy scope on her gun and... 
well, she knows how to use it. So if something comes out, she was in a perfect place to identify it and blow it away. The idea was, if her husband and the guide were to find a bear, they would make boogity boogity noises and try to divert the creature out towards the road where Mary Beth could pick it off with her rifle. The sun keeps on setting and the darkness looms on the horizon. Mary Beth is leering through the scope at around 7.55 p.m. And all of a sudden, a dark glob appears on the edge of the forest, about 200 feet from the truck, so definitely, definitely within shooting range. Things are starting to get interesting now. She's been waiting all day for this. She pulls away from the rifle, squints a bit, and trains her eyes in the direction of the glob. It's a promising glob, all right. It definitely qualifies as bear-like. She puts her face back up to the scope and sights in on it again, double-checking the glob. Yup, it's still a non-human-looking glob. It's 100%, positively, absolutely, maybe a bear. And certainly is quite possibly, probably not a human. So she has to make the decision fast or else risk missing out on massacring a cute, fuzzy forest creature. She grits her teeth, takes one last look through the scope, zeroes in on the dark glob. She decides in the moment that this glob must die and she squeezes the trigger. She does not miss. It's a direct hit, and the glob flops over on the grassy forest floor. The shot rings out across the wilderness, and the hunting guide hears this noise, and he's a little startled. He finishes taking his piss, zips up his pants, and comes trottling out to see what all the commotion was about. He glances down at where the glob was lying and screams in the direction of the truck. Hey! Did you shoot your rifle? And then Mary yells back, Yes? Uh, what did you shoot at? Mary goes, Hmm, I shot at a bear. Did I get him? And uh, matter-of-factly, the guide replies, No, you got murked. Oh, is he all right? No, he's dead. Okay. When the gravity of what just happened sets in, Mary Beth starts dancing around and getting a little hysterical. She starts saying things like, quote, I shot my husband, and I shot my love. Yep, she sure did. So, poor Mark is dead. There's no hope for him. And his wife shot him. And she shot him with the very rifle he bought her for Christmas. So it's a tragic accident, and it all gets cleaned up, and everyone goes back to living their normal lives and trying to put this sad incident behind them. Or at least they would have, if it all didn't smell a little funny. See, Mary Beth is a very good hunter. She sure is good at shooting guys named Mark. She's one for one there. And she was well trained in how to not accidentally kill people. But Mark is dead now. And, well, that's kind of a bad look. So an expert marksman such as herself would know not to fire at a random glob in poor lighting. I know it's a different time zone and everything, but even in Newfoundland, the sun goes down the same way as it does in Pennsylvania. When it gets dark, it's hard to see shit. So that seems a little bit fishy, and uh, it puts forth the idea that maybe it was a bit more intentional than Mary Beth's hysterical dancing and blubbering would have us believe. There's also the small matter of Mark's life insurance, which Mary Beth had recently up to about half a million dollars. That's quite the coincidence, don't you think? And an even smaller matter, a much smaller matter. This, uh, this smaller matter involves, uh, 
Mark's brother Barry, remember him? He was off in the blind while this whole thing went down. Well, after uh, poor Mark is put to rest and stuff, uh, Barry has moved on and uh, he's moved in with Mary Beth and is currently banging her. Yeah, it seems awful convenient that this all happens to come together in the wake of Mark's demise. It's also convenient that avid hunter Mark wasn't wearing any brightly colored hunting gear. And as bad as all this looks, Mary Beth is back living in Pennsylvania with Barry, and she seems to be coping just fine. Now, Mark's family are completely rotted with her, and they want her locked up. Apart from Barry, of course, who is way too busy shagging her. Meanwhile, back in Newfoundland, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are looking a little deeper into this tragedy, and are doing reenactments of what possibly happened. And according to the medical examiner, Mark had most likely been bending over when he'd been shot, and uh, which probably made him appear a little bit smaller than he really was, and uh, it covered up his pants, and after he was shot, he killed over forwards as the bullet ripped through his abdomen. So this gets looked into. And about two years later, the Mounties decide that they are not done with Mary Beth. So in 2008, they charge her with criminal negligence causing death and tell her to come back to Newfoundland and get what's coming to her. Now, here she puts some of that insurance money to good use, she lawyers up, and she appeals multiple times, and she makes it good and clear that nope, She's not coming back. This goes back and forth for two more years, and she's finally extradited back to Canada in 2010. In an unrelated note, Barry Hershberger shacked up with a different woman as soon as Mary was sent back to Newfoundland to answer to the charges. It sounds like he had a really happy four years filling in for his brother in bed. Meanwhile, she's back in Newfoundland. She goes to trial, and she claims that with the poor visibility and with the fact that Mark was wearing dark clothing and bending over when she sighted him, he was nothing more than a black glob and most certainly a bear. The prosecution didn't agree with that. They said an experienced outdoor person such as herself should have known that there was a high likelihood of the black glob being her husband, and therefore she intended to kill him or was at least grossly negligent in the process. So uh, they want they want her to serve four years. Now, both of these scenarios are somewhat likely. Only Mary Beth knows the truth. But what drove the case one way or the other was the testimony of the lodge keepers and the other hunting experts from the area. And they got on the stand and made it sound totally plausible that she could have, indeed, actually thought she was looking at a bear under those conditions. She could have thought she was looking at a bear. She also could have wanted Mark to be dead so she could screw his brother unfettered. That seems totally plausible as well. And Marsh Hartsberger's family seems to be inclined to go with the insidious explanation. Naturally, this changed the family dynamic a bit when the defense failed to conclusively prove that Mary Beth was criminally negligent. Mark's father was heartbroken that the case ended with this conclusion, and he remains convinced that she's a murderous lunatic. So she's found not guilty, and she leaves a bit of a sour taste in everybody's mouth when she tears out of the courtroom in a Mercedes, blaring loud happy music and being driven by her lawyer. So she's happy. She gets off scot-free, 
and the case was considered unappealable by the Canadian justice system. And when Mary arrives back in Pennsylvania, and she finds that Barry has already moved on with his life, her behavior becomes unstable. Now, Barry claims she's been unstable all along, and that she pointed a loaded rifle at him. He falls for a restraining order against her, and tries to get his 130 guns back. The order is deemed unsubstantiated due to lack of evidence, and it's thrown out. I'm guessing he never got his guns back either. I figure, though, that's a small price to pay for getting away from this nut job. And you want to know what my theory is? My theory is that she chose Newfoundland to come to specifically because she figured here in Newfoundland we are a primitive backward people who lived in houses made of ice and probably hadn't invented her own police force yet. That way she could accidentally shoot whoever she wanted to shoot and no authorities would be around to look at it. Then she would just skedaddle back to the states and no one would be the wiser. But that's just my quirky take on it. I'm probably way off here. And just for the record, here in Newfoundland, we're not that backward. And now it's time for an update. This one involves another woman trying to, well, knock off her partner. And this one's a little bit more cut and try. Just recently, a Florida woman named Veronica Klein came back home from a night out at the pub. And she was looking to continue the beverage drinking when she got back. She wanted to share some drinks with her boyfriend and asked him to prepare some when she got home. So they continued drinking. And after about two drinks, he starts to feel very ill and can't talk without throwing up. That's pretty gross, and after about 30 minutes of this, they do call an ambulance, and he's taken to the hospital. Okay, so he's getting taken care of, and the police get involved. The boyfriend would provide the police with an audio recording of Veronica flat out admitting to spiking his drinks with raid ant and roach spray it promises to kill on contact and boasts an outdoor fresh scent i guess you want your dead insects to smell good it's quite the gimmick and now she has been in custody ever since and is charged with felony poisoning so she won't be bugging anybody else anytime soon not surprisingly she has a previous record involving a couple of weapons charges. So my advice to you is, don't go into the woods with this cunt either. And there you have it. Another half-assed episode of the worst true crime podcast ever, Evil Done Badly, is in the books. Now get on your podcast provider of choice and give us a rating and tell everybody just how lousy you think we are. And if you would like to reach out and suggest future episode topics, we can be reached on Twitter or Instagram at EvilDoneBadly or by email at EvilDoneBadly at gmail.com. So thanks for listening. My name is Dick, and I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>